The Federal Reserve followed through and met market expectations. We did see the cuts that we were expecting to play out today. Of course, during the last update I had here on this channel, we laid out not only the expectation that the Fed was going to cut based on implied probabilities, but also this whole concept that the Fed just has this rate thing backwards. And we really laid the groundwork for kind of that foundational applied MMT approach to how to think about rate cuts. We're going to dive deeper into that whole subject now that we did, in fact, get the cuts. And in fact, I think there were We'll probably be another video or two in this series as we just need to dive deeper into this concept and kind of hit this from a handful of different angles. So if you're new here, make sure you get that subscription button hit with the notification bell so you don't miss those. Uh, with that being said, yeah, let's just dive into it. If you haven't watched that prior video, I'll link it below and uh, you can watch that. But just a, a very quick recap, you know, the, the whole idea is kind of the, the, the mainstream macro idea with regards to rate cuts is that rate cuts somehow save the private sector money and by doing Doing so makes it more appealing for them to go ahead and take out loans and that we should see loan growth essentially expand faster than what you would have without the rate cuts or at, at a lower rate level. And the whole idea here is this whole concept of the fact that rates are a cost. But the argument that I made last week is, look, it's a cost for the borrower, but it's also a reduced revenue stream for the lender. Yes, lower rates are going to save the borrower money, but they're also going to reduce the lender an amount of income. And in fact, I mean, those are just a one for one match for every borrower. There's a lender and vice versa. And that is just a, a, a swap when that happens. And even if we say, and this is kind of the argument that I made in the, in the video, that there is there's money saved. It goes in some sort of black box somewhere where the private sector just gets to save this money. Even if we do that. And we also talk about what actually happens from the income removed from the government sector to the private sector with those lower rates, because the government has to pay that rate on the outstanding debt or the new issued issuance of debt. If we go through the mechanics of it, at best you can say, and again, we don't know where this savings goes. That's the whole point of the last video. It doesn't actually save anything. But what we can deduce is that about for every 100 basis points, there's only 20 billion, quote unquote, saved or lower cost for the private sector in the most generous estimation possible. It's barely even a rounding error in terms of just the massive amount of flows that happen from new credit creation or from government spending. So it, it really is just a wash when it comes to anything about savings. And even on a theoretical level, it really doesn't pan out. And where we finish is with this idea that when you just look at the empirical evidence itself, it kind of smacks you in the face that, wait a second, historically, bank credit rises at much higher levels under higher rate regimes. And if we go back to the 40 some odd years of the Fed lowering interest rates from the 80s into the aughts or in, into the into the 2010s, where we went from interest rates lowering ultimately to zero or near zero through the 2010s, we consistently saw that credit growth peaked at lower and lower levels, going from about 15% growth year over year down to 10%, and then ultimately barely ever getting over 5% year over year growth in that ZERT period. So empirically, the argument that I have shows to be true that credit creation, that money creation actually gets more induced under a high rate regime as opposed to a low rate regime. And where we ultimately landed on that last video is this whole concept of really what it boils down to when there is both a supply of a new bank loan and a demand for a new bank loan is creditworthiness and profitability. It's, it's two sides to the same coin. If I want to get a loan, I want that loan to be profitable for me, right? If I have a business, I'm only going to go get that loan if it ultimately is going to be profitable, if I'm going to be able to pay back the loan interest, and then I can make something on that for on top of that to ultimately be profitable. Otherwise, it's a not a worthwhile endeavor for me to take. And so for me on the demand side, it's the profitability from the supply side, from the bank side, it's going to be creditworthiness, right? They're going to be asking the exact same question I'm asking. Are they going to get paid back plus interest so they can remain profitable? In other words, it really just comes down to the question of where is, where does this kind of creditworthiness or really where does this profit come from? And it really boils down to that core concept. Where do profits come from? And my argument is, is that in a lower rate regime, profits are going to be lower because the money creation necessary to create process gets dampened. And we see that in the empirical evidence. So let's answer this question and then kind of draw this back to the earlier discussion we had and start to you know fill out this picture more and more that under a higher rate regime, we're going to see more income, more profitability, more investment. And therefore, 
higher rates actually cause what it is the Fed is trying to achieve with lower rates. So to answer this question about where profits come from, let's turn to the classic Kalecki levy equation. Thanks, thankfully, we don't have to do the math ourselves. Already been done. And if you haven't checked it out yet, if you just search for, and I'll link to this below as well, where profits come from, from the Levy Institute, a great, uh, what, 28-page PDF that uh, that very, very elegantly explains the entire mechanism of where profits come from and to think about each step in the uh, in the entire equation yeah, great read. Check that out if you need more of an explainer. But the equation is quite simple. It's investment plus government spending minus taxes. So we'll just call it deficit spending, net government spending plus exports minus imports. So whatever the current account balance is, and that's going to give you profits for the private sector. Just more, more you know, bluntly put in, in more layman's terms, credit creation plus government spending plus exports minus imports. And in the U.S., so just to kind of deal with this uh, this last bit first, in the U.S., obviously, we, we import more than we export. And so we are leaking. That's a leakage in terms of profits. So that's profits for the rest of the world. Now, ultimately, that comes back and usually in terms of investment. But for now, we'll just kind of forget about that part or at least scratch that off. We've answered it. And let's move to really what the two kind of bigger movers are, at least with regards to the discussion we're trying to have. And that is this idea of credit creation and government spending being the source of profits for the private sector that is then going to lead us back to answering this question of where they come from and then how do we get higher or lower creditworthiness or profitability because I think that actually explains what's happening when you look at the empirical data is that the private sector is just more profitable and creditworthiness I know it sounds you know almost radical but empirically it proves out this way under a higher rate regime because more profits ultimately get created based on this basic equation. And so what we saw, and I think this is a great you know, explainer here, a great visual, what we saw in 2022 when rates started ticking higher is we saw this massive influx of interest income, right? On the left here, we have the interest payments that are being paid for higher rates. And this also goes back to that whole idea that we had in the prior video about rate cuts are going to slow the interest payments. They're going to slow the amount of income that is being added for profits from the one of the three sources here, which is going to be government spending. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. Obviously, new debt has to be issued at that lower rate, and the lower rate has to be, or the rate has to be lower than the average outstanding rate. And I understand that that you know there's some complexity in that. I'm talking you know broadest ma macro strokes here. It's going to slow down the government spending aspect of it, and th this is why. And, and I post this quite often on Twitter as well. This is why this chart right here is so important. It's in real terms government spending or the rate of change of government spending, and it's why every time we flip negative in real terms have a surplus, we end up seeing a collapse of growth. And it's because going back to the profitability equation, the profit equation for the private sector, when we run a surplus, we are removing profits just directly from the private sector. Now, you can last for a while on this credit creation, right, on investment. We can see this take place. We saw it take place in the before the dot-com bubble, and every cycle ends with a bit of a burst in terms of uh, in terms of credit creation to effectively dissave for the private sector to hold on to that cycle, and it, it kind of has to, but there's a lot of friction that happens with that credit creation, and ultimately you hit your cl kind of classic Minsky moment that collapses the the business cycle and inevitably then recreates or reboosts government spending in the terms of automatic stabilizers such as unemployment and whatnot, which then you know, recedes the profit, the profit side of the equation. So th this is kind of the core concept here, again, to build on this idea of, look, you're not saving any money when you lower interest rates. And actually what you're doing is you're reducing income when you lower interest rates. And you're also reducing the income to the lender as well in the lender borrower pair, which in turn reduces profitability for the banking sector directly relative to other sectors. So they're going to be maybe a little bit less likely to want to lend because their income is being increased. And this is why I think every time you see rate cut cycles into the end of what ultimately is the cycle, why you get this reinforced kind of collapsing episode is because you're just re removing and slowing the economy down at a time when it actually needs the exact opposite. It needs rate hikes because 
because it needs even more income into the system, not reduced income into the system. So that's the profit equation. That's where profits come from. And that is why I think empirically we see here on the right chart, consistently we get higher growth in credit under a higher rate regime and why ultimately we're not going to see some magical, you know, long sustained explosion in credit creation from the moment rates continue to drop here. If anything, we're actually going to cap where this cycle would have been as we uh, as we start to drop rates, assuming the the rate cuts continue. Now, just to be clear in terms of where we're at in the cycle, I do think we could stay an extended amount of time in a kind of continuing growing credit expansion area. There's a ton of there's a ton of money that was still created post COVID uh, that that still is a lingering effect. We still have rates that are relatively high relative to recent history. So again, I, I don't think this means that just because this 25 basis point cut happened today that it's game over, but it's the overall trend here that is not going to boost or extend this cycle. It's actually going to work in reverse. Now, what are some good counters to this? And I think the one that we need to address right out of the gate here is what about the wealth effect, right? We all know, I say that with a wink and a nod because I'm going to disagree here, but we all know that lowering rates uh, boost asset prices, right? It juices asset prices, creates asset bubbles. And the whole concept here is that lower rates inflate asset prices through the net present value of the cash flow, right? And it's it's the classic equation where you're going to lower the rates so the net, uh, net present value of all future cash flows ends up increasing. And my argument here, and hopefully you can already see where I'm going to go is, is with this, is yes, we're going to go ahead and, and get the denominator here to decrease because rates are going to come down. But we're also going to get the cash flows to decrease. Why? Because of everything that we just talked about. Less profit is going to be added into the system. Less income is going to be added into the system from outside the system when rates get lowered. So what I think everyone misses here is on an equal amount, we're going to lower the rate and it's going to be thoroughly offset by the income that would have been generated had the rate been higher and we end up with the same net present value. So all you're doing when you of, of the cash flow of the entire system, right, at the macro level, and I think it's important to reiterate that this is right now we're talking at the ma macro level for all income generating assets or all revenue generating assets. And so, or I should say cash flow generating assets. And so the, 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 the concept here, and I think where people get tripped up is yes, some companies that have, you know, we'll call it, uh, we'll call it growth stocks where a lot of the value is going to be ultimately received into the future will benefit more than companies that might be more, might be more value stocks, right? So growth might win out, value might lose. Now, eventually it just looks like all stocks went out, right? The MAG-7 went out during the 2010s. And, but now all of a sudden we're starting to see like the, 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 the Russell 2000 and, and, sectors that have underperformed for the last decade all of a sudden start you know remaining at, at par with where or maybe even outperforming the S&P because now all of a sudden it's less about what the future cash flow is going to do and what the you know what the cash flow today is going to end up giving you but as a whole the return of the system is dependent on where those new flows are coming from. And as we've already kind of deduced and decided that those flows are coming from higher money creation, either from the outside exogenously from government spending or endogenously through credit creation, which happens at a higher level empirically and I think also theoretically when interest rates are higher. So to put this to rest, I, I do think there is this kind of asset boost, but it's only going to happen to some of the assets, a subsector of the assets, pretty much the S&P 500 assets, but the other remaining outstanding assets, they're going to be lower, all things considered, relative to the total amount of new money creation that's being added to the system. So again, I think this is a wash and it just kind of confuses the picture because it's almost a fallacy of compositions. People will focus on a subset of all assets and say, oh, those inflated. Well, yeah, those inflated at the expense of the assets that are underperforming relative to the actual profitability of the new flows that are being created that would actually price all assets going forward. So 
Here's the next part with regards to the wealth effect and why I actually don't think the wealth effect happens the way that the, the, the way that kind of the mainstream does. Now, the final part to this is this idea that the Fed might be doing some more purchases, kind of a quasi QE. I know there's some debates right now if this is QE or not. It doesn't matter. QE is not important anyway. We're going to show exactly why that is the case. We have some balance sheets here. I know people are allergic to balance sheets, but if you're willing to just spend some time with them and, and go through the mechanics, you'll see that any sort of asset swap between the private sector and the Fed with regards to, and I mean, in this case, uh, treasuries is immaterial going back to what is actually important, right? And that's why we spent so much time on the whole profit equation. That is important. That is what that is what capitalism you know, runs on is new profits. It doesn't run on what the composition of assets are, especially when it comes to treasuries and reserves relative to, at least in, in magnitude to what it does for actually generating returns and generating profits. So right now we have this kind of basic Fed balance sheet, bank balance sheet. And when the Federal Reserve runs QE or does any sort of asset purchase from the private sector, all it's going to do, it's very basic here, but all that it's going to do is it's going to issue some more reserves. So we'll just say $10 in reserves. It's going to go ahead and give those reserves to the banking sector. And in return, it's going to take some treasuries out of the banking sector, bring it over to itself. And we're going to end up with a very simple asset swap. But I, what I want to absolutely drive home here is before I did this, and I can hit control Z here in just a second to prove this, the that we'll call it the bank sector, the private sector here on the right. It had $400 worth of assets and $400 worth of liabilities for the bank here. And for the Fed, it had $400 worth of assets and $400 worth of liabilities. No new money got created. Reserves were just added to the banking system and reserves are simply to settle uh, balances at the end of the day. You can't lend them out. They don't create more lending when they're forced into the banking sector. It is really a non-consequential movement. If anything, again, I think the empirical evidence and everything that we've talked about shows the exact opposite, that if anything, it reduces income and it reduces profitability to the system, therefore reducing money creation and reducing growth that would have been otherwise. But more importantly, net worth, no new profitability is created. And so this really is a moot point just to show that both before and after they look the same. I'm just going to hit control Z on all this. And you can see again, it was zeros across the board in terms of this thing equaling out 400 on both sides, nothing new ended up being created. So nothing's going to happen from the queue. I, I think actually the reason they're doing this is the banking sector felt a little short on reserves and then maybe they're trying to get more control over the long end. It doesn't matter. If anything, the, the only thing that's really happening here is I think the Federal Reserve is realizing that the banking sector needs just a couple more reserves. And so that's why they're going to do this with regards to the purchases that are starting back up. Also, doesn't matter if you call this QE or not. It is just an asset swap. There is nothing special or magical happening here, no matter what you call it, no matter what they try and do. Nothing is happening here. Maybe staving off you know, some short-term liquidity issue in the banking sector, and that is it. But before we go, if you like this analysis, you like this alternative approach, head on over to AppliedMMT.com. If you are an active trader, active investor, weekly updates over there that go into a ton of detail. Uh, my main focus is equities, S&P, and kind of the current and midterm projection of where those are going. Uh, but certainly in every video, I dive into a little theory that goes a little bit deeper. Again, active traders, active investors, it is certainly aimed for that. Otherwise, get subscribed, that notification bell on, and uh, give this video a like on the way out. And we'll talk to you next time. So good trading and follow those flows.